I think, mashallah, it's, it's a good number. We can start. Assalamu alaikum. Good uh, evening uh, and Ramadan Mubarak to everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure, actually, to be with you tonight and um, uh, keep the momentum of uh, updates and and, uh, and and cardiac science and knowledge uh, even in Ramadan. Um, our patients deserve that and uh, the, the uh, experts are are uh, very excited and and uh, available, uh, mashallah, all the time to help with uh, the education. Uh, today's topic is is very exciting and intriguing. I'm I'm very excited to hear about it as well. Uh, one of the reasons that as as common as it might be, we don't really uh, give it much of attention in our practice, and I'm pretty sure we're missing a lot of patients in having uh, this disease. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, is, uh, uh, is is well known to us since uh, medical school. Um, we don't see it or we don't recognize it as uh, often as it, we should in our practice. So having such um, uh, meetings and uh, talks will uh, increase our awareness about it. Um, no better than uh, Dr. Daniel Mati, Professor Daniel Mati, who is an adult cardiologist um, at uh, Think Place of Specialist Hospital, who will talk to us today about um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, state of the art review, talking about the epidemiology, the diagnosis, the risk stratification and management. Um, I'm looking forward to it and excited to hear. Uh, what she brings to the table. Please, Professor uh, Dan. You're mute. Unmute. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Good evening. Shukran, uh, Professor Habib, for the nice introduction. It's my pleasure today to uh, talk to you to, about uh, hypertrophic sarcomeric cardiomyopathy state of the art review. It, I know it uh, has been a long time to prepare this topic, but I'm very excited, and inshallah, you will uh, we'll learn all of together from these uh, sessions. Uh, actually, uh, I tr I will try to make everything simple as possible, but not simpler as Albert and Shine would say. So I would like to start to tell you that uh, we have a good news uh, since Amsterdam 2023. We have a new guidelines for the management of cardiomyopathy in general, and the particularity of these guidelines is that they are new, not update of an existing guidelines with the exception of the section on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is telling you how important is this disease. And they have provided a focused update on the 2014, which means 10 years later about the previous guideline on the diagnostic and management of HOCOM. So I invite you to have this guidelines with you. And the aim was to provide to guide the diagnostic approach to cardiomyopathy and highlight the evaluation and management. What is important and the central illustration of these guidelines is that it is a different mindset. It's a cardiomyopathy mindset instead of heart failure, have PEF, have REP, or have MEP. It should be multidisciplinary, and they, they insisted about it. It should be patient-centered, and it's family-centered. So this is the central illustration of that guidelines. Now, everybody knows this classification since almost uh, 20 years about the classification of cardiomyopathy into hypertrophic versus dilated versus erythromogenic versus restrictive or unclassified. Within this part of cardiomyopathy, we have the familial genetics or non-familial non-genetics. And within the familial genetics, we have sometimes with unknown genes, sometimes with the novel mutation and the non-familial idiopathic versus another disease. I will focus today about the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but please remember that there's a lot of over lap of cardiomyopathy in clinical practice, which means sometimes you have a HOCAM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it could be revealed as end stage HOCAM, which is a dilated cardiomyopathy. And uh, similarly for infiltrative cardiomyopathy could be revealed as hypertrophic and vice versa. So we have a lot, kind of overlap, and this is our job basically to try to, uh, to find the etiology. Now, this is from the previous guidelines. It tells you that there is diverse etiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and the majority of the case in adolescent and young adults are caused by mutation in the sarcomere protein gene in about 40 to 60 percent, which known the mutation, the mutation is known. In 5 to 10% of the case, you know, we have talked a lot of, about it, the secondary hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to another systemic disease, such as cardiac amyloidosis, Fabry disease, Friedreich ataxia, uh, and other neuromuscular or mitochondrial disease. 
And imagine, believe or not, 30% of the cardiomyopathy that I have present as a hypertrophic are unknown. We don't know the reason. Maybe it's genetic, maybe it's something else. The problem of the LVH is that uh, the left ventricular hypertrophy, as we can see by EKG and ECHO, are the tip of the iceberg of many, many diseases and cardiopathy that are hidden behind this name of LVH. LVH, and our aim as a busy cardiologist is to try to find red flags and sign for, for this versus another disease. Now, please remember, I don't want to, to tell you today that every LVH is something that's very rare or, uh, or uncommon. The most frequent cardiomyopathy uh, presented as hypertrophic as a classified uh, the LVH2, the hypertensive disease, or LVH2, the aortic stenosis, which is a uh, pressure overload. But also, and the stage renal disease is very frequent cause of significant LVH, at least in our hospital, it's very, very common. And I think in Saudi Arabia and the world. However, remember that other cardiomyopathy, they cause renal failure or end stage renal failure, and they may be hidden behind the heart of the kidney patient. So even without the understanding disease, we have to look for etiological disease. Now, if we are together now, and we're not the webinar, which I was wishing actually to, to be face to face, I have a quick question for you. What is the hypothesis regarding each echo I'm showing you here? You have four cases here. I'm hoping that you can see the video here, but I think it will try it. It works. Is it cardiac amyloidosis? Is this Fabry cardiomyopathy? Is this end stage renal disease? It is sarcomeric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or it's Fred Reich disease? Of course. The question will be difficult to answer uh, regarding only the uh, the echo. Also, there are some red flags for each reason. However, without the clinical context, it's really difficult to decide and to give the etiology. And that's why LVH is not enough to define the etiology. And we need an integrative approach, including the clinical findings, extra cardiac manifestation, family history, uh, lab test, EKG, CMR, and past medical history uh, to necessarily, and actually me even working with multidisciplinary team to decide what is the etiology of what you're seeing by echo. Now, I will start with a clinical scenario of a young 35 years old male with this knee on exertion, and he has palpitation occasionally, especially on exertion. And uh, when we ask him some question, he said that he has uncle, first degree uncle, he has premature and explained that. Now, if you are together again, you can see that this echo, we don't need to be a really expert in imaging to see that this patient has severe um, hypertrophy of the septum, hypertrophy of the posterior wall. You can see that the ventricle is very small and you can see acceleration on the LVOT tract causing severe obstruction on the LVOT with a peak gradient of almost 65 at rest. So this patient, you could be any hypertrophic, but because of this age and uh, the you can I can see you also the EKG here. You can see that you have severe LVH, uh, increased Sokolov index, ST change with inverted T wave. All this correlate with something that with myoset hypertrophy rather than infiltrative disease. Uh, so the hypothesis I'm asking you is it Fabry cardiomyopathy at 35 years old? Is it hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Is it cardiac amyloidosis or cardiomyopathy due to hemochromatosis, or you need more information? Okay, so as I told you, we'll try to respond to that question, but because of the aging of the patient, the history of sudden death, and I will show you to, along this uh, presentation that it's most likely hypertrophic cardiac disease. So hypertrophic sarcomeric cardiomyopathy is the most prevalent genetic primary cardiac disease in the world. It's very heterogeneous disease with very, very heterogeneous clinical courses. The main future of HOCAM is LVH, and it should be assessed correctly either by ECHO or by SAMAR. The pathology of HOCAM expands beyond LVH of the LV walls and also involves papillary muscle, papillary valve, uh, the mitral valve apparatus, and they play an important role in the LVOT obstruction pathophysiology. LV obstruction is present in up to two to a third of patients and has major prognostic implication. Uh, we need actually really uh, for this HOCAM, and this has been uh, pointed out on the guidelines, we need a cr close collaboration of different specialties as a cardiologist, expert in cardiomyopathy, expert in heart failure, uh, other uh, heart team failure, arrhythmia failure is very important, arrhythmia people, cardiac imaging, and also uh, cardiology with ex expertise in sport. And genetician, of course, very important. And we need a psychologist to announce for the family such disease. The epidemiology of HOCAM, I should take this again from the latest uh, uh, latest uh, state-of-the-art paper from Baron Merrill. The prevalence is very variable. Of the carriers, is one over 500. It's very, very common, actually. And 
for those who have the phenotype is a positive, positive phenotype is one over 1000. It affects more often young adults. And there is a big heterogeneity of the mutation with more than five, 450 mutations so far seen on the sarcomeric and found in the protein gene. And remember, 30% are not even found. So the estimated affected people is around 15 to 20 million worldwide, likely underestimated. We don't have a number in Saudi Arabia, but most likely I would say it's almost the same uh, because it's also autosomic dominant. Uh, the definition of HOCAM basically it's easy. But when you look at the literature, all the time it's a presence of increased LVH wall thickness that is not explained by abnormal loading condition, as I told you, hypertension or stenosis. In an adult with not known of family history is more than 15 millimeter and any LV myocardial segment by any technique, imaging technique. If you have already somebody who has HOCAM and you sound more than 13 millimeter, it's likely to be HOCAM also in the relatives. And in you have genetic association, it's between 13 to 14. Now we know when you do echo 13, 14, 15 is really uh, within the standard deviation. In children, you have to need, you need uh, more than two standard deviation of the predicted mean of the death score more, death score more than two. Regarding the pathophysiology, uh, the main histopathological uh, uh, feature of HOCAM include myocardial hypertrophy, disarray and microvessel change, increased interstitial fibrosis. This is an, an A, you see this is the normal heart, which exhibits organized parallel linear myocyte. And here you have a HOCAM heart, which shows disorganized myocyte. You can see uh, small, uh, small vessel changes and increased interstitial fibrosis in HOCAM. And that's why when the American introduced the uh, extensive LGE by MRI to propose a uh, to propose uh, ICD, it was controversial in Europe because most of the patients will have actually a lot of interstitial fibrosis in the disease. Now, the common pathophysiology is hypertrophy of the myocardium, as I told you, increased LV fibrosis, altered myocardial energetics, impaired relaxation, LVT obstruction, or mid-cavitary or intra-LV gradient, coronary compression by myocardium, and that's explained why sometimes people have chest pain, like it looks like a angina, and perivascular fibrosis. What are the consequences of all that? Cardiovascular mortality increased, supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation and embolic event, heart failure in 15 to 20%, of course, sudden cardiac death, which is the most uh, treatful disease, uh, treated life disease, 1% of the cases. So when you suspect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the typical approach is to look for symptoms, to have the physical exam, to do an echocardiogram and to look for the family history and to do a comprehensive echocardiogram. Now, if you feel like you are not confident to keep going on the diagnostic, you can refer to a center of reference of cardiomyopathy. What are the main ways of diagnosing HOCAM? Again, it could be symptoms at exertional dyspnea, chest pain, fatigue, maybe first episode of syncope, sometimes unfortunately heart failure or supraventricular arrhythmia, or syncope, and I will show you cases of sudden death on mainly on the soccer players on the athletics. Sometimes it's asymptomatic. You have somebody who has, or he come for any KG or for screening, routine screening, and you discover the echo. And sometimes you have HOCAM diagnosed in a relative and you look at the patient itself because he has relative who have HOCAM. So the clinical course, as I told you, it's very heterogeneous. It could be, in most of the case, stable, benign disease with normal longevity. And sometimes it, it could be uh, uh, proposed, uh, it progress over progressive heart failure, especially with the obstructive one, or advanced heart failure with dilated and end stage. It, it could be also uh, uh, occurs with atrial fibrillation in 17% of the case, uh, no adverse pathway in almost 50% of the case, and sudden death here in 6% because it's more, this study includes more young patients. This is the different form of HOCAM. Whether you use echo or MRI, you can have asymmetrical septal hypertrophy, apical hypertrophy, especially in the Japanese population, biventricular hypertrophy, mid-cavitary obstruction, or uh, end-stage dilatation. Unfortunately, it's more difficult to diagnose, and sometimes restrictive cardiomyopathy. What are the features of EKG in HOCAM? It could be normal in 5% of the adult patient and maybe less 3% of pediatric, which means it's abnormal in 95% of the HOCAM patient and it should give you the suspicion of something going on. The main specific features of the HOCAM is pathological Q waves, deep S wave in V1, V3, high R wave in V4 to V6, 2 to the LVH, with T wave changes, 
depression or very negative, especially on the apical one, and no specific ST change in uh, abnormal 56% of the case. Sometimes, if you look only at AVL, you can have uh, inverted T wave and the lateral leads, which may be the only marker of Hocam in some patients. And of course, you have no specific future, which are le left bundle branch block, RBB, especially after septal ablation, atrioventricular conduction disturbance. If you have short PR, you have to think maybe that some of this Hocam is maybe due to Fabry disease, AFib, non-sustained VT, or supraventricular arrhythmia. So to summarize here, you have normal in 6% of the case and abnormal suggestive of Hocam in almost 40% of the case. Okay, now this is uh, the, the EKG of the main future that I told you. Here you have some case. Here you have this non-specific ST change. In all cases, you can see you have this Sokolov, which very increased, and you can find also a, a larger QRS. But I want you please to remember that when you look at the EKG, look to look at the imaging on the same type to improve the positive predictive value of each EKG uh, rather than taking a long. And this is always valid also for the amyloidosis, for any, any disease in general. Real, see, because when you take the, the EKG and you take the imaging, especially also you have the strain pattern and the MRI, you can have really more facilitation to go towards this diagnosis, septal Hocam versus Fabry cardiomyopathy versus HTTR cardiomyopathy or sarcoidosis, for instance. So please read all the EKG on the setting of other modality imaging. Now, what is the role of Hocam? You already know it gives us the echo is a really uh, most common easy method to visualize the LVH in clinical practice. It, um, it can allow us to give us more red flags about the other disease that may mimic the phenotypic appearance of Hocam. And our mission as a busy cardiologist is to be able to rule out other cardiomyopathy, uh, such as aortic stenosis or other day, using also extra cardiac red flags. So the, how ECHO will help me to make the right diagnosis and what are the main future? If I ask myself this question, this is mainly, it demonstrates the severity, the distribution and localization of the LVH, the LV cavity size, um, because when you have a very, very high uh, severe LVH, it actually increase the risk of sudden cardiac death, as I will show you in the risk stratification with a cutoff of 30 millimeter and massive hypertrophy. The septal morphology also play a role, sigmoid versus reverse curves versus neutral versus apical. And some of the morphology is more associated with, uh, with genetic positive uh, positivity. The strain assessment, the pattern provide additional insight and helps you to distinguish between from other phenocopy, as I showed you earlier. The characteristic of the mitral valve are very important. And the subvalvular apparatus and the mitral hemodynamics, the number of the papillary muscle abnormalities, because we call it now, it's not a disease of the muscle, it's a disease of the mitral valve and the muscle has been described, especially when the patient has obstructive disease. You can assess for the LVOT obstruction, whether at rest or after provocation. You have related the diastolic dysfunction, which is very always, almost always disturbed and altered in this disease. The RB size, sickness and function, and the systolic PA pressure. This is the, the type of morphology I'm talking about. The most um, frequent one in 35% of the case is the reverse curvature of the septum. You have the neutral one, you have the sigmoid one when you have as many septal bulge and you have the apical uh, mid, uh, with the ace of spade cavity. Now, the strain, as I told you, it's very helpful in, uh, to differentiate sometimes in different type of left ventricular hypertrophy and the sensitivity is around 80%. You can see here for the arterial hypertension versus the whole camp where the strain is, uh, the segment strain is worse in the segment where you have the most important uh, hypertrophy in the apical sparing uh, aspect for the amyloidosis, also in aortic stenosis, but the the uh, the, uh, the ratio is different between aortic stenosis and amyloidosis and in my and Fabry disease where the inferior lateral is more affected. Now, Hocam is not only disease of the myocardium, but also a disease of the mitral apparatus and the coronary artery. And you can see here a lot of uh, abnormalities of the mitral valves as such as prolapse, systolic anterior motion abnormalities, elongated leaflet, cardiac rupture, thickening elongation, which cause also in addition to the thickness of the septum LVT obstruction. The patient also with Hocam have narrowing of the intramural small coronaries with the small vessels caused by antimal and medullary hypertrophy small muscle cells, which also contribute to ischemia, even in the absence of atherosclerotic disease. This is a study, two study actually showing you the uh, entrance mitral valve alteration in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, even in the mutation carriers. 
And you can see here, even without hypertrophy of the heart, before the hypertrophy occurs, you have already elongation of the mitral valve, which is much, much more common as compared to the control. And it could be the primary phenotypic expression of the disease itself. So look at the mitral valve and the, the papillary muscle. Now, what about the LV obstruction in Hocum? We have two types of obstruction, intracavitary and mid-ventricular obstruction or the LVOT obstruction. It could be at rest, which is worse prognosis or after progressive maneuver, maneuver. It could be, it's, it's a dynamic phenomena. Sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't have it. And that's why you should give up when you have a hokam, you have to look after it every echo. Usually it's late peaking and we call correlated also on the uh, teeth of the shark. We call it the teeth of the shark in French. The variable that favorizes the obstruction, the hyperdynamic LV function, the small LVOT, the degree of the septal hypertrophy and the morphology of the septum, the inversion of the basal septum, the abnormal elongation of the mitral valve, and the abnormal papillary muscle. The LV obstruction is very common. It can be seen at rest or after provocation and lead to bad outcome. You can see here whether you have resting obstruction, 37% of the case, or flattened or labial obstruction, 33. Almost 70% with a Hocam patient would have obstruction at the end of the day. And uh, in these cases, you have people with obstruction will go to progressive heart failure or atrial fibrillation of sudden cardiac death. What are the parameters that may affect the LV obstruction? The fluctuation in volume status, you should not give a lot of diuretics, autonomic nervous activity, diurnal variation, pharmacotherapy, exercise, a big exercise. That's why we advise for this patient not to make a, like marathon or very high intensity exercise, a general anesthesia, recent cardioplegia, or physical position or conscious sedation. How to induce LV obstruction? You can do it by Valsalva maneuver if the patient is able to do it very well, by standing position, by peak exercise, supine bicycle or treadmill, or uh, uh, at a treadmill or actually um, by uh, reco at recovery. And you can see here the recovery, the percentage of patients who develop obstruction at recovery is more important than during exercise. So it's very important this part. And believe or not, if you give patients a very heavy meal and you do the exercise after a big pizza or a big capsa or something, post prontal exercise, you will have a significant increase of the of, of the gradient, almost from 35 to 75%, you will put in evidence an obstruction if you do the exercise after a heavy postprandial heavy meal. So it's very important. This is a type of exercise you can do either in supine bicycle or in the French, in the French tradition, they put it on the, on the normal bicycle. They like the, the standing rather than semi-supine. And you can see the baseline, you have a big gradient of 14. When you put to 75 watts, you can go to 28. And when you go even more, you can reach almost 185 big gradient. Who has? And this patient, you develop abstraction after provocation. Please remember, do not mix LVT or gradient and mitral regurgitation because they can overlap, especially if the MR is usually it's very eccentric and should be differentiated because sometimes you have seven meter per second for the MR and should not be taken for the obstructive disease, especially at exercise. So it's important regarding the timing of, of the events. The major prognostic implication of LV obstruction, risk of cardiovascular death multiplied by almost two and risk of heart failure multiplied by 2.6. And you can see the number of events, if you don't have obstruction is 1.6 per year. If you have obstruction after provocation 3.2 and you have obstruction at rest, almost 8% per year of events. So it's important to deal with this majority. So how to assess the LVOT? As I told you, 2D, Doppler echocardiography, Valsava maneuver, and standing or exercise. If you have already at rest maximum more than 50 millimeter, you go, will go to go the management directly. If the patient is asymptomatic, you have to repeat the echo and to try to provocate, to try to see if there is any, any provocation. And if you provoke after the exercise more than 50, you have to treat this patient, even if he has no, no symptoms. What is the genetic aspect of HOCAM? Uh, in daily practice, very, very difficult, very frustrating, many genes, several mutations. It's an autosomal dominant disease. So the people who say it's more common in Saudi Arabia, no. In Saudi Arabia, what is common is the more recessive disease because of the traditional consanguinity marriage. But is it autosomal dominant disease? So it should be the same everywhere. More than 450 mutations discovered so far in the sarcomer associated protein, which beta mucin heavy chain and mucin binding protein are the protein the most frequently identified. You can see the table. I cannot even pronounce all the name of the mutation and the genes here. The problem of the genetic of HOCAM, why people sometimes ignore to do it, because it's uh, complex 
incomplete penetrance, variable expressivity, allelic heterogeneity, incomplete or inaccurate family history assessment, prevalence of the donor mutation is unknown. And actually, there's actually a lot of donor mutation that we keep trying to discover. So it's a long trajectory of genetic mutation of protein. And even when you look at the mutation, in 50% of the case, you do not find. And the 50 other, you, as I told you, you have the myosin binding protein and the heavy chain, troponin T and tropomyosin and others. Several mutation, the thin and the thick, and the, the thick myofilm. So all type of sarcomere uh, protein are could be affected by and causing HOCAM. Why genetic testing is important in HOCAM? Actually, we need to do genetic pre and post test counseling are essential for the multidisciplinary care of the patient and relative, for the risk stratification and management. For the patient, the diagnosis is important to know that he has family disease. The prognostic of the patient, some mutations are more prone to have sudden cardiac death or more malignant. The therapy of the patient and reproductive advice for the kids. For the relative, uncertainty and risk of diagnosis of purpose of evaluation, surveillance, and management. You have to discuss the inheritance risk with the family if they are okay, provide education of the need of clinical evaluation, perform pre and post counseling, at three, obtain a three to four generation family history, and of course, provide psychological support when as soon as you announce the disease. Uh, which patient should undergo genetic testing? All first degree family member of HOCAM, usually, uh, if they are okay, of course, you cannot do it against the advice. And the positive genetic testing results are likely to be in the patient younger than 45 of age, the wounds with maximal wall thickness more than 20 millimeter, a family history of HOCAM, family history of sudden cardiac death or syncope, and reverse curve septal morphology. And you can see here we have a clinical marker for positive with a uh, predictive model for positive genetic testing. So in other words, if you have somebody who is young with maximal wall thickness more than 20, family history, or kind of septal morphology curves reversed, you have more likely to have uh, genetic positive. And some mutations are also described to be at higher risk, but this was, has been controversial in the literature. The problem of, again, it's the genotype does not always correlate with phenotype. So sometimes you will find genotype positive, but the patient does not have the disease. So what we will do for this patient, which is a very difficult question. And this one of the studies that answered, they follow this patient for up to 15 years. And they found that 32 of patients with pathogenic variant genotype positive at the beginning of the study, they have no clinical sign, no normal echo, and they analyze the development of the HOCAM sign. And they found that almost 46% of the HOCAM at 15 years, they will develop actually the HOCAM. More likely to develop male, abnormal EKG, and uh, the lowest risk are the variant TNI3 with the hazard ratio. This is protective of developing if they have this kind of uh, gene mutation. And they have eight, almost here 300 patients. But the problem is that the article is frustrating because there's no clear guidelines on management of genotype positive, except then periodic screening and doing echo every year and annual screening for this patient. Now it's re, you can see here, it's a class one indication to for the individual and for the family to do genetic testing for the cardiomyopathy HOCAM. Uh, cascade genetic test family member, again, class one B, uh, for the pre and post test counseling. So this is the new guide last 2023. Now I know that some family in Saudi Arabia, they will refuse it, but at least you have to ask them to do it. Uh, again, genetic counseling is class 1B for this disease. Now, what is the role of CMR? I don't think I need to uh, take a lot. Everybody appreciate and recognize the important role of cardiac uh, magnetic resonance imaging in HOCAM. All patients with suspected or known HOCAM should undergo at least one CMR in the beginning and for the young even more. To confirm the morphological echo findings in case of poor acoustic window, be better special resolution. Image are independent of the body habitus, chest wall geometry, and pulmonary parenchyma disease. Better tissue characterization in case of differential diagnosis between different type of infiltrative storage or inflammatory disease. Prognostication, follow up, and monitoring of the disease. It's a class one B. In two thousand fourteen, it was one C. Now it's class one B to do CMR for everybody at initial evaluation, and two A for the patient for the follow up. Mm -hmm. Especially if you are, uh, or also you want to monitor the response is 2A. So it's really a very strong indication. Role of CMR in HOCAM, when the echo is suboptimal diagnostic quality, uh, more enhanced precision about the septal thickness measurement, uh, RV muscular structure are more better seen on by MRI, identification of the hypertrophy area in LB sometimes, 
anatomically blind to echo the apex, the anterolateral free wall. Sometimes we miss it, as well as well the subtile morphological change and the gene career without LVH, including the blood filled myocardial crypt and the uh, elongated mitral leaflet in expanded extracellular space. Quantification of the LV mass, quantification of the myocardial fibrosis with LGE, because it's important for the sudden cardiac death in American guidelines. Pre-operative planning before invasive septal reduction to define better the LV out of low trace anatomy. This is the different form of HOCAM. They are very well described, better in actually in, in, in MRI, by MRI rather than echo. And I showed you already the apical is better seen, the anterolateral form, and the uh, asymmetrical, uh, the, uh, the other side, uh, the, the, the part of the myocardial that is not seen well by the echo. It has excellent diagnostic value of the LGE, and it allows us to rule other cardiomyopathy that mimics sarcomeric one because of the tissue characterization by LGE or by D1 mapping, as it has been shown and described on this illustration by latest guidelines. The extra cardiac manifestation will improve even better the positive predictive value of CMR, especially if you have mental retardation or if you have a visual impairment, if you have gait disturbance, you can think of Friedreich ataxia versus if you have neuropathy, hypotension, uh, muscular weakness, cutaneous changes as in Fabry, etc. So really always interpret the MRI and the imaging on the context of a patient with the extra cardiac manifestation. So to summarize the clinical utility, it's an uncertain diagnosis, it's to confirm the diagnosis for the management, obstruction localization, and it's a marker for increased sudden cardiac death if you have extensive LGA or apical aneurysm. Now, this is important part. I hope that you are not tired so far. Uh, syncope and sudden cardiac death stratification. The syncope in HOCAM is, uh, is very, it's almost frequent. It occurs in one over four HOCAM patients. It can be due to supraventricular arrhythmia, sinus node dysfunction, complete heart block, ventricular arrhythmia or LV obstruction, inappropriate vasodilatation, volume depletion, or diastolic dysfunction with mediated hypotension. And the episode of syncope actually increases the risk of sudden cardiac death. So if somebody tells you that he has a syncope, especially on exertion, be careful and take it seriously. The sudden cardiac death is no less frequent, is infrequent in Hocam to the opposite of what we think. It's around 1% per year, especially in young patients. The cause of mechanism of sudden cardiac death are ventricular arrhythmia, autonomic overreactivity secondary to LVT obstruction, microvascular ischemia, myocardial fibrosis, myocyte disarray. The risk factor for sudden cardiac death, of course, personal history of syncope or cardiac arrest, ventricular fibrillation or sustained VT, abnormal blood pressure in response to exercise, and that's why we need to do exercise for this patient. Family history of sudden cardiac death, as our patient I showed you earlier, and high genetic risk, genetic mutation. So it's really important to know the family history of the patient. And this is what happens usually. They have non-sustained VT, then VT, and then degenerate into ventricular, uh, ventricular fibrillation, what, uh, and what happens in some player I will show you later. So you have the cause of sudden cardiac death, so just a nice summary here, severity of the LVH, which gives a scar or fibrosis, microvascular ischemia, myocyte disarray, non-sustained VT, you have the trigger, you have the gachette, the apical aneurysm, you have the family history of sudden cardiac death, and the explained syncope, abnormal response, uh, blood pressure to exercise. HOCAM is the first cause of sudden cardiac death in a competitive athlete, and you can see here 36% of the HOCAM uh, present with sudden cardiac death. You can see here recently, Erickson has been, has the sudden cardiac death when he was playing uh, soccer at the age of 29. And thanks God, alhamdulillah, they have the fibrillator and they saved him, saved his life. And now he's playing again in the British team. That's what happens to him, exactly what happens to him. And they were able to shock him. And this is the history of many, many other athletes, American athletes that died also, unfortunately, because at that time they did not have the fibrillator on the, on the, time, at the place of the sport. So they died from most likely HOCAM. Just to summarize you, the, the, the heart of the athletics versus the HOCAM, the heart of the athletics usually is more dilated. The E of ray is always more than one. The septal E prime, they have good relaxation, more than eight centimeter, often more than 13, super relaxed, better than 13 to 14 centimeter. The GLS global strain is usually low normal or normal. The ventral valve has no significant abnormalities. We don't have intracavity obstruction. The RV is enlarged, the RE is enlarged. And when you do exercise for this athlete, you have increase of ejection fraction more than 15% during exercise because of the reserve. And this is totally different in whole patient where you have a small cavity, abnormal relaxation, decreased compliance, decreased GLS, abnormal mitral valve, 
uh, and some with intracavity obstruction in 70% of the case, and no contractile reserve as exercise. Now you have the risk of sudden cardiac death calculator to predict the five year sudden cardiac death more for the more than 16 years old adult. You can take here the age, the severity of the LVH, the left atrium size. Don't tell me why it's size still not volume because I think it's old one and they don't want to update it to put the volume inside. The LVOT gradient, the family history of sudden cardiac death, the sustained VT and the unexplained syncope. Just to show you here the huge formula from the multivariate analysis that showed you that the family history has a weight of 0.5 multiply and the non-sustained ventricular is almost 0.8, while the maximal wall thickness is only 0.15. And that would explain you when you put yes in non-sustained VT or unexplained syncope or family history, you will immediately have risk of sudden death increase more than 6%. And that's why here you have from the guideline, if you have more uh, risk predictor, more than 6%, it's a high risk. Usually the ICD is indicated by class 2A. If you have low risk by the calculator, less than 4%, uh, ICD class 2B, if you have one clinical, one more clinical risk factor, which I'm saying here, and especially the family history, the LV systolic function and extent of myocardial scar. And in between, it's 2B between 4 to 6%. And it's always a shared decision making. You don't, should not take the decision by yourself with the multidisciplinary team, with other colleagues, and with the family and the patient. Now, in 2023, we have also, alhamdulillah, Hokam risk kids. For the kids, we have also now a risk scoring because as I told you, this disease also affects the young patient and you have almost the same uh, parameter except that they're adjusted for the death score. Now, finally, I will have maybe more 10 minutes to spend on the principle of management of HOCAM patient. First, for the follow-up of HOCAM, how should we evaluate them? At initial evaluation, everybody should have a clinical examination, EKG, 12-lead EKG, transthoracic echo, contrast CMR, exercise echocardiography, and 24 ambulatory halter EKG. This is the, are the minimum that should be done for every patient presenting with you with HOCAM. On the follow-up, annual clinical examination, annual echocardiography, CMR is is the, it says here in this paper, maybe three to four years, it's up to you. You can repeat it if the patient is young and you have some other parameter that should allow you to, to make it more often. The exercise echo is again individualized depending on the one you the patient presents symptoms and you want to, to prove that he has obstruction or not. The alter EKG, they said every one to three years. In our practice, we do it every year and the 12 ECG is always every year. Now, the classical management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy goes with the symptom management, the patient education, the family education and screening, and the risk stratification of sudden cardiac death. And we did not have much about except medication to improve symptoms with the beta blockers or verapamil. But remember, this medication does not decrease the risk of sudden death on this population. You can also have disopiramide in patients with obstructive physiology, but it's sometimes limited to uh, arrhythmia people to, this, to prescribe it and ICD in high-risk patient here. And of course, you have the choice for the more uh, invasive susceptor reduction therapy if the wall sickness is very important. I will give you, if I have time, something about it. And the myotomy. And of course, when patient has atrial fibrillation, you have to anticoagulate him the whole life. And if you have advanced heart failure, then you go to the heart failure team. So the management of the HOCAM is in the, the aim is to improve symptom in symptomatic patient with LVOT obstruction. And for the symptomatic patient without LVOT obstruction, we focus on the arrhythmia problem, reduction of the LV feeling pressure, and treatment of the heart failure. If the patient is have ejection fraction less than 50%, then you go with the patient with half MEF or half REF patient with the classical medication, the foundation therapy. If the patient has more than 50% ejection fraction, then you go to the beta blockers or verapamil and low dose diuretics if needed. And if the patient has severe LV obstruction, then we'll talk about LVOT management later. And if he has atrial fibrillation, of course, rhythm and heart control and anticoagulation. For the management of outflow tract obstruction, if the patient has symptoms, then you have to give beta blockers class one. If it's still symptomatic or intolerant or contraindicated to the beta blockers, then you can try the verapamil class one or diltiazem class one. If the patient is still symptomatic, you can go with the new medication, mabacantan to one or disoparamide class one. And if still symptomatic after, they don't give time between each step, septal reduction therapy if needed. Now, the classical therapy that treats symptoms actually and reduce LV obstruction, but so far there is no targeted underlying disease biology. It means all the medication that you are giving, they are not 
uh, targeting the disease itself or the pathophysiology of the disease that we will talk about it. They may, as such as beta blockers or verapamil, they will reduce the obstruction, they may reduce the symptoms, but they will not treat the etiology really. Also, again, the alcohol septal ablation or the myoctomy. Now we have a new class medication, the cardiac myosin inhibitors that target the whole pathophysiology. And the first in the class is Mavacantan. It's allosteric inhibitor of myosin atipase, uh, atipase, sorry, I'm not saying in English, in French is atipase. It improves balance of the myosin on the uh, super relaxation and disorder straight relaxation conformation. And it reduces the number of myosin acting cross bridge and decrease contractility. In other words, when you have HOCA mutation, you have this imbalance between the disordered relaxed state and the super relaxed state, which improve, uh, increase the contractility, the patient become hypercontractile and decrease the relaxation and energetics. When you give this medication, you will try to make an equilibrium between the, uh, this disorder and super relaxed state, and you will decrease the hypercontractility of the myocardium and improve the compliance and energetics. Uh, so with the, the medical name is Camzios. It's a selective allosteric and reversible cardiac myosin inhibitors, and it modulates the number of myosin heads that can enter and power generating states, thus reducing in HOCAM and the probability of force producing systolic and residual diastolic risk approach formation. We have the first study that, uh, that uh, looked for the Mavacantan and evaluate the effect of this medication on symptoms control, exercise capacity, and in symptomatic patient class two and three obstructive HOCAM. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, 13 countries phase three trial. And you can see here that uh, the difference was in the primary endpoint at week 30, it was significantly different and in favor of the Mavacantan as comparing to the placebo treatment. Also, all secondary endpoints were found with a significant improvement uh, with the maximum peak uh, oxygen consumption, NIHA class, quality of life, and uh, the uh, other components. Also, when you look at the uh, tolerate, toler and side effect and tolerance of the medication, it was almost similar to placebo with few dizziness, very uh, syncope, some dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, and some dysthymia, but they were not significantly different. Moreover, the LB ejection fraction that were different between, that were not significantly different between both, despite the, uh, the, the, uh, the things that we are afraid of, actually. So the conclusion of Explorer that the treatment with Mavacantan improved exercise capacity, LV2 obstruction, NIHA class, and health status in patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the result of this pivotal trial highlight the benefit of the disease-specific treatment for this condition, the third one. And this that's why it goes into the guidelines at the class 2A in patient with the cardiac myosin atipase inhibitors to the maximum tolerated dose with echo surveillance of the LV ejection fraction. And it should be considered in addition to the beta blockers or verapamil to improve the symptoms in adult patients with resting or provocated LVOT obstruction, or even as first line monotherapy in symptomatic patients who cannot uh, intolerant to the beta blockers or uh, disorpyramide. Now, one word about the factor pro and against surgical myectomy. I will look at that time. I'm not sure if I'm finishing. Yeah, I think I'm finishing my time just to show you that sometimes we have some indication for the septal myectomy, surgical myectomy, and sometimes for the septal ablation management. Uh, the pro for the surgical myectomy, the high success rate and experience center, the low operative risk, and the long term uh, survival. But the problem is sometimes you have a high surgical mortality in experience centers. And sometimes you have to weight the benefits for the ablation versus the myectomy. And for the ablation, sometimes you have risk of complete heart to block, uh, operator experience, and the patient if he wants to do it. Sometimes you, pro you, you want to do ablation because uh, comorbidity, uh, limited expecting lifespan, sedentary patient, lower gradient, left big heart, and elderly, and you don't have really data about the influence of sudden cardiac disc. Whereas the myectomy is more offered for younger, healthy population, long expected lifespan, active patient, high gradient and greater thickness and coexistent maybe structural disease. We have novel treatment. I will not go into details. We are working on general genetic derangement mutation on the mutation of the sarcomeric, gene-based therapy, uh, novel pharmacotherapy, pharmaco, uh, novel procedure of surgical papillary muscle realignment, apical myectomy, transcatheter mitral repair, radiofrequency, high intensity focused ultrasound. So there is a lot of uh, going on, something going on on this uh, field and really evolving very fast. So in summary, my friend and my colleague, 
Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a long journey from symptoms to final diagnosing, starting by recognizing the symptoms, uh, confirming the hypertrophy by EKG, echo, and CMR, to assess the LVOT obstruction at rest and after provocation, to try to be able to differentiate and to rule out other diagnosing, to do other imaging if needed, PET uh, for the amyloido, uh, nuclear for the amyloidosis, for instance, or some genetic testing for the Fabry, laboratory testing, to, to confirm genetic etiology of the disease and to do the cascade family screening and for risk assessment of the patient of sudden cardiac death. And I would like to end telling that the changing spectrum of the disease and misconception about HOCAM, it's more reassuring. It used to be considered as rare disease. Actually, it's, it's found to be the most common cause of elevation, the absence of hypertension. It used to be considered a disease of the muscle only, actually disease of the whole muscle and the papillary muscle and the mitral apparatus. It's thought to carry a high mortality rate, actually, most of the time, and most of the people are treatable with normal longevity and life expectancy. And I hope that I was able to cover all this field coming from the clinical symptoms, echo, MRI, risk of sudden death, and genetic aspect. And the take-home message is, HOCAM is the most common now, everywhere with a prevalence of 1 to 500 in general population. Only 10 to 20% are identified clinically. ECHO, EKG, CMR are synergistic for the diagnosis in probant and family screening. Genetic testing can identify affected individual without HOCAM. Long-term follow-up of the patient is crucial and the family members. HOCAM is treatable and consistent with normal longevity, making timely accurate diagnosis a priority for us. HOCAM is a very heterogeneous disease from clinical symptoms versus no symptom diagnosis, morphologically, hemodynamically, genetically, prognostically, everything benign versus progression to end stage, medical and electric versus surgical and interventional management. There is a lot of diagnostic challenges, special localized forms versus severe forms versus elevated secondary to storage and filtrative disease. It's challenging in predicting the risk of sudden cardiac death is only the accuracy of the risk score I chose you is only 69%. It means in 30% of the case, we are not able to predict correctly the risk of sudden death and new therapeutics agent may have a great impact on outcome in HOCAM patient. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Nati. This was a very uh, thorough and very nice overview of the disease um, and its impact. And um, it was very exciting, actually. Um, I would uh, ask the uh, our colleagues and, and attendees to submit their questions in the Q&A section. Um, and uh, uh, until we have more questions, I'll probably start uh, by asking uh, Dr. Dania. Now, uh, we're recently we've been we've been re realizing or um, diagnosing more and more patients with FPF. Do you think we are misdiagnosing many of them with other diseases like OCAM or amyloidosis, uh, rather than just labeling them as FPF? Uh, missing the the management uh, proper management of these patients. Actually, this is a very nice question. Thank you, Dr. Walid, uh, for this question. Actually, what when we put the half in fact, it's a big big bag when we put everything inside. And actually, we I uh, I, I was asked to do a um, uh, talk about half pef multimodality imaging half pef, and actually it shows you in fact that half pef is only a kind of syndromic things, and we have in fact to look of the etiology of this half pef. Population. However, when we took in our mind in half path, we think about elderly patients, 70, more than 70 years, more female. And here you can see that HOCOM, it's more as the young adult disease. So basically, we are not missing a lot when you say half path. However, for the hemolidosis one, yes, I think we are missing almost 15% of the cases where we label them as as half path, whereas they have uh, um, there is etiology behind it. But for the HOCOM itself, the sarcomeric one, I don't think so because alhamdulillah they are different pathology, different population, different uh, demographic than they have by itself. We've been seeing more Fabry's disease as well. Um, clinically, how would you differentiate these two, Hocum and Fabry's? Actually, to be honest with you, this has been very, very, very difficult. Until now, there was a big study in France. It was like maybe 15 years ago. And they took systematically all HOCAM. They took maybe 200 HOCAM. And they did systematically for them, irrespective of other red flags. They did a test for the saliva. And the, the, you know that, uh, I don't remember how we say it in English, the, to, to look for the, uh, the galactolysis deficiency. 
And they found actually that almost one to 3% of this population, they have actually Fabry. So uh, yes, we are missing a lot of Fabry behind the Hocam one. And if we want to look at the Fabry one, unfortunately we have to screen everybody with Hocam, the one known like, like I said to, to do, to eliminate the Fabry. In men, it's easy to do with the saliva test. For female, it's more difficult. We need to do genetic testing. And that's why we have now what we call NGE, next generation sequence. We have almost to find to look for eight genes, not only the Hocum, but also the Fabry one, which is more uh, X-linked, and the ATTR one. So you have one test, not the uh, whole exome, but only this gen the seven, the most frequent one, to look for them. And if you find the Fabry, then you discovered the whole family of Hocum, of, of, of her Fabry disease hidden behind the Hocum. But yes, they are hidden behind the Hocum. Excellent. Now you talked about GLS strain and uh, and the differentiating between the different types with GLS. How how specific is that, and is it operator dependent, and 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 how how comfortable are we with this? I think you are pointing out something, but <laughs> you are teasing us as as, as the echocardiographist. Actually, to be honest with you. Uh, of course, it depends on the uh, expertise of the doctor. But however, if you have a, a minimum of expertise and you have a good machine, I think the uh, pattern would be helpful. I would not say it's it's like specific and the sensitivity almost. We are trying actually to do a meta-analysis about the sensitivity and specificity of this pattern, specifically in amyloidosis. But in other disease, you can see if you make a little bit change, you can see here that some segmental would be lower than the other. And usually we think about absolute value. However, in this pattern, I agree with you, the segmental one are not really, really accurate. I cannot give you a number of the sensitivity or specificity, but it's still actually, it's a pattern. Like they always say, Fabry has more than anthrolecture segmental. If you find it, that's fine. It's specific, but if you don't find it, it doesn't eliminate the disease. So I agree with you. It depends on how you do this, uh, this GLS and the repetitivity. Usually what I always say to people, don't look on one time, do it repetitively at three weeks, four weeks by different operator. And you find the same pattern, then maybe yes, it's related to some reality. But there's no number really of the sensitivity. I think for the amyloidosis, 80%. For the Fabry, we don't have a number, but I, I would say is maybe specificity is better than sensitivity. Excellent. Um... So you talked about uh, mebacamptan and and its uh, uh, its role in assessing the pathogenesis of the disease itself. Why is it still uh, after uh, beta blockers? And could I start it from the beginning? Um, what what do we know more about it? I know it's a new drug. Uh, yes. If we know more about its uh, safety and its its long term effect. Yes, exactly. Actually, as you can see, we have only one study. I present the Explorer Hocam. We have other one, the Valor Hocam. I did not present it today. I don't have the time. But the problem is the number of patients included. It's not like when you have 5,000 people or 10,000. You have maybe here 300 divided into two groups. So we still have, and that's why they call it 2A, the, the problem. So we don't have really a big number of patients to make it a clearly a class one indication. Also, they did not uh, uh, target like robust outcome as as mortality or outcome at long term after a few years. It's only after 30 weeks. The safety is here, of course. Now, we, we don't know how many patients we have to give. And also, it's really they wanted to, to, uh, to, to target the uh, obstructive disease one. And you can see here, some of them on 50%, they don't have obstruction. So uh, you, you target actually the... Um, the disease pathophysiology, but the aim of that uh, study was to decrease the symptoms and to decrease the obstruction of the patient. So if you don't have obstructive, we don't have enough data for that. But we need time. Okay. If you have yeah. more study going on, we, we may have more indication and more higher level of indication. And also the cost, we don't know yet the cost in Saudi Arabia and other places. Okay. Um, now, when would you just send the patient directly to surgery uh, instead of trying uh, medications? What is the indication to go for surgery from the start? Well, I uh, I have been looking at the guidelines. Actually, the the the, the surgical myectomy is always as when you start all medication and when everything failed and the patient is still symptomatic. Yes, then you send, but not directly. There is no guidelines to send directly without starting any medication. 
I would say myself by experience, if the patient is very young and the sickness is very, very big, I mean like 30 millimeter, 35, there's no cavity, very small obstruction, very small LVOT, the septum is like this, then I think, yes, we cannot avoid not taking them to the surgery. Even then you start the beta blockers, then you have to think and discuss with the team and the surgeon about it. And especially in the experience center, you don't hesitate much. If they have maybe severe MR as well, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like when you have uh, exactly, I yes, yeah, sorry. When you have like usually when you have a huge thickness, you have this elongated MR and you have this eccentric, and you have to repair the valve and to uh, uh, to fix the the valve, and the, then then you would go, of course. Excellent. Now here's the one question I might answer this question, although you touched on it. The 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 the, uh, the question is about. When should you manage hokum uh, um, as as heart failure? As you mentioned very clearly, if the ejection fraction is above fifty in the heart path range, then this is where you use your beta blockers and and uh, calcium blockers and mebacantin. Fraction is reduced less than forty percent. You reduce like any heart ref patient with your uh, ACE ARB ARNIES. Uh, beta blockers, probably aldosterone antagonist, and 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 SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, did I summarize it uh, correctly? Great, you are the heart failure guy. You are the boss for that one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, do we know anything about the the safety profile of uh, mevacamten side effects? Uh, any yeah. expected? Uh, yeah, I showed the slide about it actually. The dizziness. The few episodes of dysfunction, systolic dysfunction of the EF decreasing, but it's only 5% of the case, 15% of the case. But you know, as yesterday we were talking about this side effect to the patient in the clinic, I said sometimes you give placebo and then the patient will have side effects. So it's, they were there were side effects, but they were not significantly different from the placebo group. So hopefully it will be uh, uh, not affecting the, the our idea about prescribing this medication to improve symptoms and quality of life of these people. Um, I think we're coming to, do you have any preference? Uh, no, I know the guidelines usually uh, differentiate starting beta blockers first, calcium channel blockers. I think it's because of maybe more commonly used, but um, in, in symptomatic wise, do you see any difference between beta blockers and calcium channel blockers? To be honest with you, from my experience, I think the the verapamil and diltiazem are really tolerated, especially in men. The, the beta blockers will give them more fatigue, uh, so they would prefer maybe the uh, channels, the channels inhibitors, uh, the calcium okay. channels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they are more tolerated, and I like them. The disropyramid, I don't. For me, it's. I think I, I always ask yeah. my husband who is EP to prescribe because it's kind of I'm not familiar with this medication. Maybe more with arrhythmias and things like that. But otherwise, uh, we 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 were taught in medical school that it's more of contraction. That's why calcium channel blockers pathologically should work better. But I think it's it's if you control the heart rate, if you relieve uh, the the uh, in, increased uh, contraction, it helps the symptoms uh, much. Do you do you typically uh, do exercise testing for all your patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Honestly, yes. In whether in Europe, in France, or in Saudi Arabia, I tend to, especially if they are young, less than fifty years, and I know they are able to exercise. Now, I'm not doing what the French team are exercising to put on the normal bicycle like this and doing because it's very difficult technically. But we do it on the supine bicycle. Sometimes you can do it with a treadmill if the patient is not able to 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 bike. But yes, I think we should do it for everybody, even with resting with normal. Because sometimes the balsava is not very good, well done. Actually, to be honest, we think that we're doing very well, but the patient is not doing very good balsava. So I think exercise good. A lot of information, especially of the uh, non-sustained VT, decrease on the blood pressure, and all this information that are very important for the decision making. Excellent. Um, looking forward to have more uh, uh, studies on Mabacamton and uh, hopefully hard outcome studies, which will help a lot in decision making. Um, it was a pleasure actually having you tonight, Dr. Adani, as usual. Um, I do thank all the attendees. MashaAllah, exceeded more than 300 people. The topic is very exciting. The speaker is very uh, interesting as well. So uh, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you all. 
يعطيكم العافيه if you have any final words to Dania. Well, I would like to thank you all the organizers from the Saudi Heart Association. And maybe you told them that they will have two CME credit for this meeting. It's not only about uh, medication, it's really about education of the patient, education that uh, us about this. And it was a pleasure for me to prepare. So uh, so thanks and thank you, Dr. Walid, to be uh, to be with you in this uh, meeting. And hopefully we can repeat it in face to face to have more workshop and more question and answer from the uh, with the Echo Live uh, cases. Inshallah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.